All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I, uh, it, I always enjoy being able to exchange ideas, thoughts, questions with uh, everyone in our community because we live in a very, very special place. Uh, Nashua has a wonderful uh, family atmosphere, a great place to raise a family. Uh, and I feel honored and privileged to have served as the mayor for the time that I have. Uh, we have been recognized for being a very strong community in a number of ways over the last couple of years. Uh, we were found in one survey to be the second safest city in the United States. Uh, now this is due to many factors. Police and fire do a great job. And the city government, the Board of Aldermen and I have done a lot over the last few years to strengthen those departments because our priority is to make the community even safer. We also, though, it's due in large part to the character of, of Nashuans, uh, the second safest city in the United States, because of the 182 cities that were surveyed. Nashua was second lowest in terms of the number of personal assaults committed by one person on another because this is a community of civility and respect uh, where people uh, act civilly towards each other and that is something that I'm very proud of and which is very, very important. Uh, we also were recognized as the fourth best run city in the United States. Hey, hey. <laughs> um, now, this is due, uh, the principal measure is the cost of services versus uh, the quality. And on a per capita basis, given the quality of services we have here in Nashua, uh, we were uh, ranked fourth best out of you know, close to 200 cities in the United States. Uh, but we are fortunate to be also to have a very strong team of people uh, working to advance our city to make it better. Uh, Fran Nutterupham is on, in the state legislature. Uh, she is, um, uh, and Christine, Crystal, 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 I'm, your last name? Crystal Lloyd, she's new, I'm sorry. Crystal Lloyd is a new state rep in Ward 6, and they have done a really good job up in Concord fighting for Nashua. Uh, Paul Patty is the, uh, on the Rail Commission, and Tim Cummings back here is uh, head of, he's Administrative Services Director, and so we appreciate everyone who is working to uh, move the city ahead. Now. There are a lot of things that are going on in Nashua, and I want to discuss a few of those things, and then you know, we'll, I'll be glad and, uh, to answer your questions and, and uh, comments and anything that you want to talk about. Uh, you've seen over the last few years, we've made a very significant effort to improve our infrastructure. We've paved 120 some miles of streets. Uh, there was a long, long period of where not nearly enough was invested um, in street maintenance and other infrastructure projects. We've done a lot with the sewers and the sewage treatment plant. You don't really see that, but very important to the way the city operates. Um, we have uh, recently done a large school project. You see the benefits, or we're in the mid midst of a large middle school project. You uh, see that here. Um, Fairgrounds was completed uh, in the fall, uh, not of 22, but of 21. The students came, fully occupied this new space. Uh, Rick Dowd, who r is running the project, ran the project, uh, and is now working on the other schools uh, with the Joint Special School Building Committee. Uh, and I toured, we toured this building uh, just before it opened in uh, August of 2021. And teachers, the staff, uh, they couldn't believe the difference that uh, we had brought about, that the city had brought about as a result of uh, the work that's done here. It's solar powered, um, 21st century technology, and the whole idea is to just totally upgrade the middle schools across the board. Right now, Penichuk is being worked on and will be completed 
uh, over the, it's mostly done, but will be completed over the summer. Uh, and right now, if you go down to the south part of the city, uh, off Buck Meadow Road or Cherrywood Drive, you see that there is a new middle school being constructed there to replace the Fairgrounds Middle School. Elm, Elm, Elm Street. The, the, the Elm Street Middle School. And um, one thing I wanted to mention to you is the fact of community power. Um, this is something that we believe uh, can cut your electric bills. Now, community power is an approach that's been used across the country to provide power to residents and commercial customers as well at a lower price than the traditional utility. What happens is communities, in our case, the city of Nashua and 16 other municipalities, counties across New Hampshire would band together to buy power on behalf of their residents. Uh, this is something that was authorized by the New Hampshire legislature several years ago and which has the details of which have been ironed out uh, at the PUC and in the legislature up in Concord. So the and the community power organization, it's called uh, Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire, here in the national community power, uh, has engaged experts that have worked in this field for a long time. And come uh, April or early May, we expect uh, that we will begin offer, you're purchasing power on behalf of uh, the residents now, and, and, and others that are Eversource customers, Eversource customers only. Now you've seen the price of electricity skyrocket to 22 cents a kilowatt. Uh, there are other, uh, there are ways to, if, you, if you're in the market at a different time, if you're bidding for, for power, for electricity uh, at a different time than Eversource, there's a great opportunity to get it for less. For example, the city right now, uh, many of our contracts are uh, we, we, we're buying a lot of electricity under a contract that's now been in place for about two years and will go about two more uh, for f 5.9 cents a kilowatt. So as a result of that, you and all of our taxpayers and citizens are saving $1.6 million a year. Now, there's an, the community power organization will not be able to buy power at 5.9, but even if we can save 2.5 cents a kilowatt, uh, less than the average, less than the, the Eversource price of 22, that amounts to $100 a year on average for a residential uh, customer. But you will retain freedom of choice. And the reason is, is that if for any, you will automatically go in, you will still receive bills from Eversource. Eversource does not produce power, but they deliver it. So if you look at your bill, it is made up of a number of different charges. They will still be, Eversource will still be paid for all the distribution and the other factors that they're being paid for now, except for the price of power. I just looked at our bill and, you know, the Eversource charges mounted to, you know, 150 or so, and the, the, um, the, 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 the delivery was 150 or so, but the electricity itself was something like 240 or $50. Uh, so you, you, will not, you will still be billed by Eversource in the same way. But if any time you want to leave community power, you can always do that and go back to Eversource. So this will give you an alternative that you do not have now. You can either, uh, you will be switched to community power, you'll still be billed by Eversource, you won't notice anything, but uh, if for some reason you want to switch back to Eversource, you can always do that. Uh, and I think you have to do it for the beginning of a month, but. Uh, that uh, uh, is a good feature of the program. So we are um, optimistic that we can save you a lot of money, and we're trying to save money for Nashuans in many different ways. One thing I wanted to mention before we go to questions and comments is the revaluation which we had recently. Now this is a state-ordered, state-mandated, state-regulated, state-supervised revaluation. If we had had a choice, we would not have done this right now. And the reason is that the value of property, residential property, houses, went up so much, on average more than 
At the same time, the commercial property in the city, the malls, the industrial property, offices, maybe went up, depends on the building, but didn't go up nearly the 40%. So, what it, so state law says that we allocate taxes based upon the fair market value of all properties. So if, just as a hypothetical, if one property were 10% of the entire value of the city, they pay 10% of the taxes. And we'd have 29,000 property, property payers, so it gets allocated across that group. What happened is that before the revaluation, residences in total were paying about, represented about 65% of the entire value of the city, which was at that point around 10 billion, and commercial was 35%, roughly. After the revaluation, because the residences, the homes went up so much, the residential properties are now much, much are closer to 70% of the total as opposed to the 65. And commercial, as a percentage of total, has dropped from approximately 35 down to something closer to 30. That has pushed everybody's property taxes up. Now we know that this has worked, this is this is hard. Uh, the I mean, the, the fundamental, the most expensive things that, this, that any community does here in New Hampshire and really probably across the country is schools. Uh, you know, more than 60% of the money when you add it all up goes to schools, salaries, buildings, capital costs, everything like that. Um, here in New Hampshire, we have the lowest rate of state support for public education of any of the 50 states. So we're 50th in New Hampshire, and that's the system. We have no income tax, we have no sales tax, but property taxes are very high. So we know that this revaluation uh, causes hardship. Uh, we're trying to offset it and save costs in any ways that we can. Uh, one thing we're trying to do for those who are on fixed income is increase what we call the elder, elderly exemption. Uh, this, if you qualify given income and asset levels, you can have a great proportion of the property tax forgiven. Uh, you do have to be at least 65. Uh, and right now we have the biggest of the elderly exemptions in New Hampshire, uh, but this will advance it uh, once passed by the old alderman and uh, put into place. This will, um, you know, make that even larger. That's an effort to help the people stay, people stay in their homes. So with that, why don't I you know, conclude for the moment and take any questions or comments or anything that uh, you would like to uh, get into. And if you could wait till I run over to you with the mic. Um, you, you in the room won't hear it on the show, but the show will see the video. So that's why I need to have a talk when you use it. All right. Yes, Fran. Well, I know technically Elm Street Middle school is not in Ward 6. Yes. Um, it's in Ward 4. But so what's up with that? I was sorry not to be able to come to a meeting in the middle of the day. Was it yesterday or today? Yesterday. Yeah. I've been to all the Zoom meetings. Um, but I wondered who makes the final decision about we're going to sell this part or that part or whatever. So, the, so over time, uh, we have taken a lot of community input about this in various ways. Uh, a lot of it occurred during COVID, so there was a lot of, there were Zoom meetings. There have been some in-person meetings. Uh, and, but no final decision is made yet. Now the, sort of the substance of the conversation has been that people I th would like to see kind of medium density residential with a, an affordable component to it. Now, medium density means, you know, uh, two or three stories, not, you know, 10. And it means on that parcel, there might be three or 400 units. Uh, so that is the direction it seems to be headed. But another thing that has happened is that Riviere University uh, is seeking to establish, they have these teams, but, they're, but they need better facilities. Uh, they believe that their um, uh, ability to attract students 
and to just move the university ahead would be greatly benefited by a full-fledged varsity men's and women's hockey programs. If they have this, they could play, if they had uh, these and a, and a home rink, uh, they can play, you know, other teams, St. Saint, Saint A's and others like that around the region. And uh, just the school spirit, this, actually the, uh, the, uh, the fans that would be developed locally would really help the university. And really to the extent that Riviere strengthens, it strengthens Nashua. So um, they've been working with Conway, but Conway has only one sheet of ice. And the high schools, all the youth hockey, everyone is using that. So really, Riviere doesn't have the access to it that they fully need. And I don't even think they can play home games. They don't have two locker rooms. They don't have an away locker room, this kind of thing. So. Sister Paula, who's done a fantastic job at Riviere, has helped, uh, has, has attracted the interest of something called Edge Sports. Now, they are a profit-making uh, builder and operator of ice rinks, and they own maybe a dozen ice rinks around New England uh, and elsewhere, own or are developing. They, it seems, would be willing to come in and build two sheets of ice and offer Riviere whatever time they need. There would, of course, it would be leased, but re ice time would be leased, but Riviere would be the prime tenant. So it's possible that on about a quarter of the site, down where the portable classrooms are now at the corner of Chestnut and Lake, you would have two ice rinks. Now those would be available to Riviere and to anyone else in the community who would want to use it. Again, like Conway, would the ice time would have to be leased, but uh, they would be there for the community's use. So that has been presented uh, to the community, to the Board of Aldermen. So far, the, um, the feedback seems favorable, but uh, we are still taking input and Ultimately, you ask the question, who makes the decision? Ultimately, uh, the Board of Aldermen decides and votes how to dispose of any city property, and uh, this would follow that same rule. Okay, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Um, the middle school presentation yesterday was uh, 1 to 3 o'clock, and uh, I thought it was an odd time. Um, and it was well attended, I mean, for that time of day, probably 25 plus residents or so. The uh, people doing the presentation said there were only going to be about 100 units and they were about 1,000 square feet each, but I guess that includes, that's a gross, the net would be maybe 750, but there was a lot of discussion from people around parking, everybody had issues of parking, but um, about the ice rink, the Keef, um, all different scenarios and, and I think it's really important to have more at different times outside of like the presentation that they did the community whatever it was called um, yesterday afternoon was good because you could just speak and ask several questions and follow up with somebody else and it was great and there were residents there and business owners um, I'd like to see more of those because it seems like Sometimes when things are presented at first and it might be just a pipe dream that people don't go because they think it's a pipe dream and it's never going to happen and the closer things get to happening the more people uh, want to talk about it and th unfortunately the less information is presented because we don't have a local newspaper anymore and that is um, a real disservice to our community because there's so little ways to get information uh, disseminated where the Telegraph used to um, do a lot of reporting and standing up for the average common man in Nashua and now that is gone by the wayside unfortunately um, I have a, a few things that I'd like to all right but can we talk about this Elm Street about. thing for a minute so yes I think we want to put in more we want to take more public input yes um, I don't know where this hundred units comes from now That's there's what the gentleman said well um, Tim is here, but we, we, there's far more space than that. Now, one basic decision that has to be made is do, is the middle school raised and new 
completely new units built, or um, is the middle school rehabbed? Um, at least with the Board of Aldermen, there are a couple of problems with rehabbing the building. You don't get as many units, number one. Number two, there still are some structural problems with the building. And uh, with, if you were to replace the building, I mean, you could get, with parking on site, three to 400 units. And that's been presented to the Board of Aldermen. You can see those plans um, online. So I agree, yes, we should take more community input. I um, mean, we, we kind of see which, what direction it's going, but you know, it's an important decision. And uh, you know, hearing from more people is certainly a good thing. Um. I'm glad that we're having this dialogue because I find that there's no um, meetings presented by the City Hall that allows for dialogue of questions asked and maybe someone taking notes so that you get back to people with concerns. Um, I feel like the three minutes at the Board of Aldermen meeting is not enough. It should be at least increased to five minutes with no Zoom allowed anymore at the Board of Aldermen meetings and the people who attend, increasing to five minutes would not be too detrimental because um, there's three, four, five people maybe that attend and if there is something really pressing where there's a lot more people, good, you have a lot more opinions. But I would like to um, request that the speaking time be increased to five minutes at the Board of Aldermen for all residents. Um, so, so yes, the dialogue is a big thing because when you go to those meetings and you say, here's some information or here's a question, um, I've been told directly, this isn't the avenue, we, there's no dialogue, you're not gonna get an answer. And so it's very frustrating. When you have people who decide to take their time and get involved in city government because they love this city and they want to be involved and they wanna see it move forward in a positive way and have things to contribute, that you get kind of treated like well, that, that there's that's, not. Well, that's why I'm here. And yeah. this is the fourth meeting we've had like this. We do them, we've done one, wards one, four, five, and now six. Right. Uh, we have the other wards scheduled. And prior to COVID, I was holding a coffee every month. Now that kind of got interrupted by COVID and we will resume with that. And we've held a few as COVID has ebbed and flowed over that period of time. But uh, we'll resume with that, I think, as soon as we get through with the meetings. But with it with our ward meetings but uh, your input is very valuable but um, I would like to if other people have questions I, w I, w I would be glad to come back to you but I think we should allow other people if there's anyone else here's somebody and I have two others when all right two others but yeah my questions about the what is it called community choice How, what do you name the uh, utility uh, well, we call it um, national National community power, yes. National community power. Um, or, uh, who's going to minister it? I mean, who's going to be uh, buying the electricity for you? So there is a, a firm that does this for other, pl other, con other communities around the country called Ascend. Okay. And they, um, they, their approach is different than Eversource. So what Eversource does, at least right now, is they go out once every six months with one massive contract. Now, Ascend uses a different approach, which is they, they use some artificial intelligence and they enter a variety of smaller contracts in which they, you know, from, they purchase some here and some there and through diversification and uh, not going into the market with a huge uh, requ request or huge a purchase. Portfolio. Yeah, a port yes, very good, a portfolio, yeah. a portfolio of energy suppliers and in that way, typically lower the price. Um, what do they get uh, per kilowatt to administer a contract? Do you know? Um, well, they certainly get paid uh, the, I need to ask exactly what the number is. I just have the idea that it's, well, it's certainly less than a penny, but uh, I'm not sure how much less. Yeah, and what's a and on top of that, what does the city uh, want for branding it? You know. Well, the the um, we are the <clears throat> the legislation that authorized this 
um, sets forth you know, what, a, what these communities can do. And the communities can, they can, charge up to one-tenth of a cent per kilowatt, but that money has to be reserved for a, any, you know, energy projects. So if we wanted to establish a solar farm, if we had that opportunity, if we had set aside this reserve fund, we would be, enable, we would be able to use that money to uh, do that energy project. But, the, but no, none of this revenue can go like to the general fund. This has to be a completely separate operation. Yeah. Um, something attracted you guys to this. Uh, what have other cities done with it so far to make it attractive? I mean, save people money. Yeah, I mean, but as far as the uh, solar farm, has anybody done that? Well, in New Hampshire, um, I, yes, elsewhere. This well, this has not happened in New Hampshire. Before. Okay. This is uh, this was just authorized two three years ago. It's a lot of back and forth at the PUC regarding the details. There have to be, you know, enter the regulations as to how the utility works with community power and uh, all kinds of details. So uh, this would be the first New Hampshire venture. But elsewhere, yes. Um, but you see community power in a number of Massachusetts communities and in other states around the country. Yeah. So it's not it's not like a co-op kind of thing. It's kind of like uh, we're getting licensed through a uh, or a for-profit company, but they're uh, using their leverage or their buying power, yeah. and, and then our carrot is is we can build something maybe with it if it works. Now, another thing that we can offer, uh, or that we will offer, is the option for any resident to select a power mix which is different uh, and greener than the basic. So right now, I think. Uh, Eversource is offering around 20% green power. There would be options available. Now, you'd have to pay more. But if you said, I want 50% green power, you would have that option. You would have a higher price, but that's what uh, your energy portfolio would be. You could say 100%. Now, at some point, Eversource offered this as well, but they said their participation was so low that they stopped. But I know. Um, my wife and I, we bought 100% green for a couple of years, and then they stopped the program. Um, and it costs some more, but not all that much more. I don't remember the exact numbers. OK, I'm good. Thank you. Yes, Chris yeah. Crystal. Hi, thanks. Um, so I guess, what are the updates on the asphalt plant um, going in? Um, That's kind of the big one. So just for background, uh, what we have is at, on Temple Street uh, at the site of Newport Construction, which is up near um, the end of Temple, up near Henry Hanger, the owner has proposed, as you've asked, an asphalt plant. Now, we believe that this is not good for the neighborhood. We're, we're working to transform that eastern part, eastern part of the downtown into a residential neighborhood. And I've already permitted one project that, you know, they're holding on to and haven't built, but there are others that could come forward. So um, there is, so, and there's two layers of zoning there. There's the underlying re uh, industrial zone. In that, if that's all there was, uh, you know, Within an industrial zone, an asphalt plant is a permitted use. But because we are see because there's potentially a rail station there, and because we're seeking to encourage residential development, there's a so-called overlay district, which um, imposes additional conditions. And and you need to satisfy you, an applicant, needs to satisfy a number of conditions. And we don't think an asphalt plant can do that. For, exa for one example, uh, the one uh, thing that the applicant needs to show is that it will not negatively impact the property values of neighboring owners. And uh, Mr. Cummings here has uh, been working with an appraiser who the city has engaged, who believes that, and is going to offer the opinion that this will impact the 
value of surrounding properties and you know, bring those values down. But we also have environmental concerns, uh, you know, the odors, uh, we just, and, and the truck traffic, it's, it, it's, the projection is 120 to 150 trucks a day. These are heavy trucks um, and though that could spread a lot of odors and other things. So uh, for various reasons we're concerned, but the applicant is pressing forward and the hearing on that, at least the next hearing on the asphalt plant, both sides are marshalling a lot of evidence, so it keeps getting delayed. But they just submitted 500 pages of stuff in the I think yesterday. But uh, the next hearing, at least potentially, is March 14th. Before, excuse me, March 16th before the planning board. So that's a Thursday night. Will that have public comment? Um, once the hearing is opened, yes, there will be. You know, anybody can speak at a planning board meeting. Um, now, uh, we were thinking the other day that probably this isn't going to get resolved that night, <laughs> but, but, um, but uh, there, it's, we, we're thinking, you know, it'd be, we should open this to the public, even though it's not like, there's not likely to be a decision, we need to begin to take this input. So it's likely that there would be public, you know, public input. So, so you know, the planning board follows a fairly strict set of rules under state law, but, um, you know, they have to, quote, open the hearing. And once they open, and the hearing hasn't even opened yet, really. So once they open the hearing, then anybody can comment, including the applicant or anybody else who wants to, you know. Yes. Um, a couple times in recent years, I've asked about, so, oh. Thank you. Uh, a couple times in the past few years, I've asked questions concerning sidewalks along Robinson Road and from Bishop Gurdon out to East Hollis, East Dunstable Street. Yes. And again, there's expense and everything involved in that. And the previous alder person got an estimate from the city to do Robinson Road the entire length would be close to a million dollars. Right. With the infrastructure bill passed at the end of this, of course, during the past year, are there funds available the city could get to well, finance more sidewalks in the city? Um, possibly. Now, that's a good thing which we should follow up on. I mean, the, the, I mean, we're putting a lot of money into infrastructure, but, but because the streets have gotten so far behind, that's where the money is going. I mean, it's, we're spending around $7.5 million a year paving streets. So we need more sidewalks. There are a lot of sidewalks that need to be fixed. And the sidewalk, you know, some sidewalks are okay, but there's a lot that aren't. Um, the Robinson Road one is an expensive project because you know, it's lengthy, plus the topography is not good. You'd probably have to take property from people. You know, it wouldn't be easy. Um, but I think, but I'd love to follow up on the issue of whether we could apply. Now, we have applied for various things. Um, we did get, uh, through the help of Senator Shaheen and Congresswoman Custer, we got an, a grant of $3 million to build a park between the library and the Court Street building, the city Court Street building where the Streeter Theater is. Uh, there's, we've, we've had a design for a while, but have never been able to come up with the city money for that. Uh, we got six, was it Tim, 300 or 600 for the ramp? Uh, uh, 300. 300, uh, th half the cost of building a uh, handicap accessible ramp at the north end of the cotton transfer bridge going over the river. There's a ramp on the south. But we have not gotten any money for sidewalks, but I'd be glad to talk about to people whether that's an, at least an eligible possibility. Okay. Do you live on Lund Road or Robinson Road? Or? I live on Delta right off in Robinson Road, oh, yeah. and I walk along right. those. And, right. and particularly on Lund, where it, where it crosses over the stream there, Yeah. it's, it's pretty treacherous. And yes. people because of all ages from... Young school children, yeah. people walking the dogs, elderly, everybody. Yeah. Well, you know, you can see that. Pro I, I mean, I'm guessing that the Lund would be 
easier because the topography is better. I mean, there's no slopes and stuff like that. Because then, you know, on Robinson, there's slopes coming along. Um, that playground um, on Robinson, you know, would be an obstacle on the north side. We did move the wall, I think, a little bit to improve the there park. Is, yeah. To improve the parking, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I raised the issue with a different suggestion, but, but yeah. that's an improvement. Yes. Um, but we'll look into this, and thank you for raising it. Karen, we'll come back to you now. Um, I, I wholeheartedly understand what you're saying about walking because I walk that way also, and the speeds on Robinson Road is something I've been working with the National Police Department over two years about, um, and with Alderman Elizabeth Liu got a crosswalk with flashing lights and a uh, flashing speed thing in there, reduce the speed from 30 to 25, and there has been a difference because there's been two different traffic studies, but, um, but it depends when. And Lund Road with uh, BG getting out of school, it's really, it's a real, um, it's a death trap if you're trying to walk there. Um, I've, I've, reser I've resolved to walking in different areas because of that. And I, you know, I've said to the PD, you go out to do things for your health, to reduce stress, and then you see these cars coming at you at 50 miles an hour and they're like this. So it's really, um, it does everything but alleviate the stress. So it, and thanks. It's, it, is, if, it is a danger. I mean, you gotta be careful. Yeah. If Especially you know anyone when... who's been hit by a car, it can be really bad. Yeah. So um, be careful. Thank you for bringing up the asphalt because that was one of mine. So thank you very much. I appreciate it and it was good information. And everybody's been saying, hey, when's the, when's the hearing? When's March, the hearing? March 16th. And so thank you because now I can just tell people and you know feel like in the know. Um, but now the delay, I mean, to some degree helps because absolutely. it enables the city to gather more evidence, information. Yes. Uh, an environmental law firm seems to have become involved and uh, on, on behalf of the owner of um, the riverfront landing and so, not an adjacent, but a nearby property owner. And so, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I've got a sign or two in my yard. Oh, good. So, um, but yeah, the speed in our, in our ward coming off the highway, exit four, uh, there's a lot of accidents in the intersection of Robinson Road, where you have Robinson, East Dunstable, Lund, the highway. Um, I know it's on the hot sheet at the PD, but it's, it's really, um, it decreases our quality of life in, in Ward 6, Yes. the speeds. The other thing I wanted to ask about, um, the elderly exemption, I realized that um, it's increased uh, the amount that people will be able to or the exemption has increased. However, the asset, there's two parts to this, and I think it's two RSAs. One is the um, exemption off of your property tax. The other is the assets that you're able to um, have. So you can have currently $150,000 in assets. Correct. Which is, does not include your home, does not include your car. So you live in that home and drive a car for a person. And you can have income, two people, up to $50,000. Actually, that's even one, but it's not noted that way in the pamphlet, it's which e is- It's either one or both. Yeah, one or both, but it just says income up to 50,000. So it's right. a little confusing when you're reading it, but one person can earn the 50 or two people can earn right. the 50. However, if you have, okay, you got the home, you got the car, you know, on the side, and if you're working a part-time job or not. But if you have a person who, let's say there's been a trash collector working for the city of Nashville for 30 years with a family, putting away some money in a 401k and they've got a nice little nest egg, let's say $300,000, they, when they hit that 65, they're not eligible because they've got money in a 401k. They've been doing everything they're supposed to do their entire life, saving money, living in the city, and now they can't utilize it because they have a little bit of a nest egg, which most likely is just going to keep them in their home if they're disabled or injured or sick. Mm -hmm. And that part of the RSA has not been touched or addressed and needs to be um, so that it's not just $150,000, maybe it's one eighty-five dollars or two hundred, dollars because then 
The, I think, uh, I don't know my numbers with me, there might have been, I think Alderman Cleese said 176 or 180 some people who were taking that exemption now or hit, who paid no taxes. That amount would be spread out to a much broader yes. number, like three times the number of residents in Nashua over 65 could take advantage of some tax break. It wouldn't be no tax bill like some people have now. It would be maybe a third less or 25% less. But wouldn't it be wonderful to hit 800 to 1,000 people instead of 187? Yeah. Well, so I'd really like to see. Uh, now, more than 187 get it now. But um, I think what you're saying is there are 187 who pay no taxes whatsoever. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I believe the number is, you know, 400 or, five, you know, somewhere in that range, 450, 500, something. But, um, you know, you're right that as people's incomes rise, the exemption should. Correct. And that hasn't moved. Right. So that needs to be addressed. All right. Thank you. Now. We've got a little more time. I usually try to finish by 7 because often we have other meetings and we really want you to come back. If we go on too long, we found like people don't really really want to come back. Sandra. I just want, I just want to clarify on the flash or a comment. Um, I, it could be for the Board of Education too, but I prevention is a huge word for me. And uh, I work with individuals with developmental disability and mental health and all of that. And, it, and sports is a big thing for me and for my, has been for my life, for my children. My children are locked to have a, a mom like me that encourages, that pursues. And, and But my son, they had, a, they had a, for example, they had a tryout here at the school, more than 100 kids. Tryout try for, for what? Basketball. Okay. One example, one sport. For the middle school team. A few get selected. Yeah. So that means 100 boys that could be practicing. I don't care if they're going to the NBA or if they're going to play for college or if they're going to play in right. high school. They were rejected, like no space for you. So then they're home, they're playing video games, they're what, what doing about nothing. Youth, what about youth basketball? Um, I mean, the city runs leagues. The leagues are another problem because Could they go we to don't that? have enough coaches. Oh, really? Okay. And it's twice a, a week. Like, my son plays, like, Friday and Saturday. And there's, like, 25 kids in one team, so they don't get the, you know, the plate that they could yeah. get. So... I'm just thinking, how can we do encourage more? And I know we have the YMCA, we have the Boys and Girls, we have the Pale, but those are little, little yeah. bit here, little bit there. Um, what well, that, can we we'll have do? to think about that. You know, yeah. um, when and I was at, when I was is, that age, I mean, I'd, I'd say your son's probably fairly tall. I would say, <coughs> don't give up. Um, when I was uh, that age, I don't think I made the, the, the school team. And I played in a church team for a while. But then, you know, as I got a little older, I then, you know, got on the high school team. I played on the varsity and, you know. Yeah. So I would say <clears throat> he shouldn't give up, just keep trying. Um, but that's an interesting observation that we should Maybe have more opportunities for kids. That's you know important, and so um, let us think about that a little bit. How to do that? Uh, um, the I youth leagues are you them. know a good uh, uh, opportunity, but if there aren't enough teams, there aren't enough coaches. Of course, that's a problem. I, I'm not concerned so much about my kids because Miles wasn't picked sixth grade and seventh grade, and then he was picked for eighth grade, and then now in high school he has an amazing opportunity which it wasn't even in, I didn't even ever dream about right. it. So you, you know my kids personally. But um, I'm concerned about the other kids, you know, those right. other, if my kid was the number 199 other kids mm -hmm. are not included, like right. the sport after school. Right. Um, and the other thing is the prevention started early in school, like we should have the health class in kindergarten, 
you know, the, 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 the specific word, the level, the, you know, but teach the prevention, teach how bad drugs and, and now they, they invent other things in alcohol and what does to a family, what does to a brain. It's just prevention. Start the, the you know, I, I thought about um, middle school, but I think we should go like third, fourth grade, kindergarten even if it's possible. So maybe we should, I should just get more connected with the Board of Education and just see what we can. Now we have the Prevention Coalition. I am which, part of the Prevention Coalition. Which they do a good job, but you yes, know, they don't, they, they, do. they can't, I guess, reach everybody. But it's a small. You know, they've been um, working very hard for quite a few years. As you, If you're involved, you know that. Many years, yes. Yeah. And I just keep pushing for lower and lower grades. And because when you get to high school, you know, it's, too late. Jan, Val Jan Valuka has been running that for a long time. And yes, and very, she was a teacher. Very dedicated. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. Uh, I've been a poll worker here for thank the last you. three years. You've been a poll worker, so thank you. You're welcome. We need that. <laughs> My question is, who funds the elections is at the state level, the city, city level. City pays for it. The city pays the election workers and the and the costs of running the election. Okay, so the state can can set the rules, but but each individual community correct makes the decision of how much people you know get paid and what gets spent as yes. far as equipment and so forth. Well, the equipment again is a, uh, the the city decides you know how much to pay people. And, and, you know, is in charge, as you've seen, of hiring and training and all this. Now, the state works with our, our city clerk to make sure the rules get followed. Uh, but in terms of the equipment, meaning the, the machines, uh, the, you know, the voting machines, that is totally controlled. I mean, it's paid for locally, but uh, you can only buy state authorized machines and there's only one machine that is state operated now uh, authorized now there's been some frustration in the last few years because these machines are outdated and uh, there are better machines on the market and we've had some trouble with the, uh, some breakdowns you know these are older but uh, the state secretary of state hasn't authorized any new machines. And the city clerk, clerks, there's an organization across the state, you know, a uh, city clerks or a town city clerks organization has been uh, trying to encourage them to uh, make, you know, a new authorization of a machine that they think is, is better than what we're using. Uh, but right now, we, you know, this is the only thing we can, the only alternative there is. is, is there Have any you had trouble in Ward 6 with uh, uh, any of the machines breaking or, or there was a problem of put the ballot in and it wouldn't? Get jammed? Yeah, yeah, it got jammed, right, right. The ballots were getting jammed or stuff like that. Have you had any problem like that in Ward 6? Um, I haven't noticed anything serious along We had along a, a couple that, places. But there's a lot of things with booths and supplies, and there's a whole lot of areas where potentially things could be improved. And is there any talk about increasing the stipend for poll workers? Well, we could think about that, yes. Since I hear What do you around, make? What do you make? What do you make? $6 What's your, you know, you are which, what position do you hold? Um, are you a selectman? No, it's, it's, it's the base one. And if you could, if you work the whole day, yeah, which just no, it's like 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 the polls are open for oh, four, fourteen, yeah, and you have to be there an hour early, and it's anywhere from two to seven hours afterwards, depending on the election. It doesn't matter what do you how get? many hours. It's what do you get for that? One hundred and seventy-five dollars. Yeah. Well, you're essentially a volunteer. I mean, you know, really, but <laughs> right, right. But that's what what we. Like the state reps. Yes, right. <laughs> they get $100 for six months. The yeah, <laughs> yeah, the whole year. They're up there every day for at least six months. So they get $100. But All right, 
good idea. But mostly, thank you for you know, doing it because everybody who does that is very dedicated. It's not, not easy, especially in the presidential years, as you've already experienced. Heavy turnout. So a lot of tension, pressure, people are complaining, whatever. Yes, Fran. So on the side of mental health, is Nashua committed to make nice green spaces, walkways, paths, bike paths? Our youngest daughter, Cassandra, who's like 34 now, interned at City Hall and came home with these wonderful plans for Fields Grove and a, a little bridge. It wasn't quite on Fulton Street, but maybe the next one over. It, you know, it, it hasn't happened. Um, over Fields Grove? Yeah, a, a little bridge to make a walkway around Fields Grove because okay. there's all the swamp land and whatever. So, but that kind of commitment to making our city pretty and walkable and to encourage people to exercise in safe places away from cars. Um, <laughs> is there a committee that works on that or, you know, well, what we, more well, can we do? We are committed to it. Um, <clears throat> um, it is important and you know over time I think we've done a lot there's there's things that are in the works for example you know we have four or five hundred of acres of conservation land in the southwest we have Mine Falls Park we have Fields Grove which is uh, kind of an inner city jewel and, and you live close to that um, now we have a grant for example to uh, extend the uh, rail trail from City Hall to the east to Henry Hanger. Um, that is in design. There's a little bit of um, some obstacles have come up, which you know we could get into. It has to do with there needs to be a little bit of land taking and things like that. Like the asphalt plant. It goes. <laughs> it goes. Walk right to the it asphalt. goes right to the asphalt. It goes right by it. I mean, this is like what we're complaining about. It. You know, it's like adjacent to the. Now there's a rail. Uh, there's a. Um, a fence there, but yes, it goes right to the asphalt plant. So, and right by it. Um, we have another grant to, you know, we get this grant like three, four years ago, supposedly, we haven't gotten the money yet. So to um, uh, improve the walkability of French Hill. So this would uh, expand the sidewalks on Lock Street, which uh, it's a, wa a walk-in school, Mount Pleasant. Expand the sidewalks on Lock Street and would have to make Lock Street one way because you need to narrow the street and then it would be paired with Whitney. So uh, Whitney would go one way and Lock Street the other, but this would greatly improve the walkability and sort of bikeability of that neighborhood. Um, you know, we would, this, there's a big cost to this, but we would love, I mean, I believe, you know, I, the master plan recommends that we narrow Main Street and uh, add, um, bike lane to it uh, and more and wider sidewalks um, I don't but that's a you know very costly project so I don't know you know whatever will happen with that uh, the river walk the riverfront has a lot of expanded walkways once we get that going uh, that is also in design and Tim can tell you that you know the, the, <laughs> the engineers and all these people have it's kind of over the you know they well, it's going to take six more months. Okay, six months pass. It's going to take another six months. So this happens over and over and over. Now, supposedly they're going to be finished this year now, this spring. Starting construction this spring. Yes. Ooh. And where will but, but, but I don't, don't take that to the bank. I mean, <laughs> what, what, you know. Don't believe it. Uh, you know, when you see it because we've been hearing this for a few years, but they have us over the barrel. I mean, what do we, we fire these people and get someone else, it'll take, delay things for a year and, and. Well, where, uh, where would this river walk be? Well, it would, um, it'll be along the Nashua River. It will just expand and improve what you see there. There will be docks and the things like that. behind the library? Behind the library, on the other side going up to BAE, but also to the west going down um, on the north side to the Cotton Transfer Bridge. The Renaissance Park on the south would be expanded and the view over the river would be vastly improved. Um, 
the and the really the par you know the parking would become a park and the uh, Water Street ramp would probably become one way and there would be parking added along it. Um, Water Street used to be one way. Do you remember that? Water Street used to be one way. It, it worked that way, right? Right. For a long time. Forever. Right. And you know who changed that? You know who you know who sponsored you know who pushed changing it? Now it's in your ward, or this ward, Victor Devarney. Remember him? He was a fire fire, fire chief. And yeah. was a Ward 6 alderman, head of what was then the traffic committee. Yeah. And he was a good guy, and he, you know, he said we should make it two ways, which we did, but really it could function one way, yeah. and uh, parking could be along there and uh, enabling us to expand the park. So those are, but there's, there's plans online, so if you really like to look at the details, you can find that. Plus, disc golf is coming. Disc golf is coming. Love it. Seven o'clock minutes. Yes, I and have, I have one last one. I, well, just let's, can we stick with Dick's? I want to thank you for agreeing to serve on that committee to advise public works. Um, you know, your efforts have been valuable. Thank you. Yes? We provide bus for the kids. Is it one mile away or two from the school? I'm not. Um, I think provide. it's a mile or it's three a quarters. Mile? I forget the exact. Because but it's not, it's not two miles, no. Not two. It's a mile. No. It's a mile. Okay. Could be like less than a mile because I'm heavily well, involved with the project with the legislature. That's up to the school board. Okay. And we spend, I don't know, seven million on, on uh, bus transportation. Wow. Uh, that's going up. It, it, you know, the bid they put, I think it's out for bid now for another year. Or, and they expect the bid, the, you know, the, the amount to be greatly uh, increased. Um, they only get sometimes one bid, maybe two, so the cost of bus transportation is going up a lot. So, of course, shortening the distance would mean more buses mm, and, you know, all that. Okay. Because we try. We try to get a van. We try to get churches involved, but then nobody wants to drive to take the responsibility because you're driving kids to school every day, yeah. you know, yeah. to school and in home. So, so it is a big problem. It could be a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that's up to the either. school board. Now, it is seven o'clock. Like we would like, I, you know, I think we should f finalize things. But if you have one more question, if somebody wants to raise anything else, if not, thank you for coming, and um, I really appreciate your input. And we'll be back next year. All right.